It don't matter what I try I just can't win and I don't know why There's a fork in every road I pick the wrong one and then I go American loser, yes I am Disenfranchised from everything well, I fall up and I fall down An American loser the day I was born Welcome everybody, we're back to American Losers, the podcast that puts the spotlight firmly on second place. Due to the coronavirus, we'll be wearing these masks during the entire episode here. This is for your sick and the safety of those in the studio. Mike and Mink taking great I can't do it. I can't keep up with that one. <laughs> All right. Don't spit on the mic. Uh, Don't spit on the microphone. Uh, coronavirus scare 2020. It is what it is, guys. But uh, Kahuna's got a face on right now. I'm enjoying that. Yeah, I really do. I mean, it was <laughs> it's great seeing you guys, but like, I'm not risking getting sick. Yeah, uh, it's weird. They built a booth. He hasn't come back from behind the glass wall. <laughs> Instead, yeah. we have a puppet in studio today. Uh, a Hi, sentient. everybody. It's... <laughs> It's little Kahuna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, concerning. We're we're being um, we're podcasting live from a shared universe podcast studio in Eatontown, New Jersey. Mike and Ming Duke, you guys take great care of us. I don't know what happened here. They've they've built this weird glass facility. It's almost like Independence Day when they're investigating the alien that they captured. So uh, we feel like um, Kahuna's in the Bill Pullman side of the glass, and my father and I are Enjoy. now going to be. Wearing right. our yeah, we're putting on our Breaking Bad outfits, and we're going to go in and investigate. <laughs> when, when you have the sneeze guard over the salad bar, that's one thing. That's I'm <laughs> adjusting over the, the entire studio. I'm adjusting the knobs using those stick out gloves through the fucking glass. <laughs> there you go. Like you're handling nuclear you material. Yeah. <laughs> nuclear waste. Oh man. Well, it is what it is. Hopefully, um, we learn. Uh, uh, hopefully, the, the panic subsides here as we go. And if anybody's actually legit affected by this, I know South Beach Larry came all the way up from Florida in order to play in a couple of bagpipe parades that are just not happening. Yeah. All Canceled. Right. I'm uh, losing gigs left and right, too. I mean, I, if you count all the gigs I've lost at, I've lost at least $28 worth of appetizers. Um, so three, <laughs> three film sets I was supposed to work on gig? all got canceled. I believe, dude, it, it's, we're in full panic right now, man. And it's, um, it's great, too, because then I finally took a job that requires me to use the Port Authority almost every day. So. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say, though, too, that for those that have lost loved ones, that's, uh, that's small potatoes. Comp- you know, we're complaining about small things that Comparatively, compared for sure. to what other people have gone through. So. Yeah, yeah, we also don't know. In about three weeks after this podcast, it could be that this is what's wiping out the human uh, race, and we're just sitting here laughing about it and sharing jokes. Welcome to American Loser, your best podcast in face of the apocalypse. <laughs> there you go. If you're going to end the world, uh, why don't you smile end it with going us? out? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Let's uh, let's say one thing though. Podcasts can still be enjoyed in any variety of mediums, and uh, if I cough during the episode, it doesn't get on the audience. So let's enjoy right. this if we can. All right. Uh, by the way, for those curious, uh, uh, as of right now, my show uh, on Friday, which is tomorrow at Characters in Slotesburg, this episode will not be out. But as of right now, I do want to give those guys credit for still having the show together. So. Um, we got a killer episode this week. Um, Kuhn, are you familiar with, uh, cause we do. Did I'm you tra- call it a killer episode because of the virus or because there's <laughs> actually like. It's got puns. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> cause I was looking at you. I was like, did you do that purpose? No, no. <laughs> I couldn't a, tell. Killer is one of those words I just use all the time, man. It's a, it's a filler word for me. It's, um, not quite as bad as, uh, uh, not for nothing. You know, KP, that doesn't make me feel any better. That makes me a little more concerned, to be completely <laughs> honest with you. But who are we talking about this week? We got a good one, bud. And it's, uh, are you familiar with, uh, on the show in the past, you've been with us since episode one, all right, which was, uh, Sorry. You know, our, our boy Grover Cleveland. Um, <laughs> Way back when, Grover. You know it. Yeah, well, coming up on two years. Um, yeah, Gunnar Holy Grover was a different crap. Grover, but that's uh, <laughs> I'm the president. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, so today's a good one. Uh, they're all good ones, I like to feel. But this one is uh, is interesting because it actually takes place in the relative modern history. Okay, okay. we don't do too too much here. Uh, we like to we hit a lot of Gilded Age stuff. We hit a lot of uh, revolutionary stuff. We were on a Wild West kick recently. Um, the, 19, the early 1900s fascinate me, and people, it gets skipped over a lot because it's just like, oh, yeah, there were two world wars and a depression. You know, so uh, people kind of skip over that sometimes. But uh, today we're going to go into something where 
uh, my father, as a historian, is great <laughs> with um, his uh, his uh, you know references, if you will. Living we, history. We now have uh, this is something that the <laughs> South Beach Larry lived through. So uh, and this is because uh, I know you're going to have relatives that live through this as well, Cahoons. So, really? Well, yeah, this is a good for the one. time period. Anyhow, when did this occur? Uh, well, t- this week we're going. This is our most modern topic ever, which is uh, funny because um, people have this complex. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Where uh, there's the idea that uh, in my head the '90s were 10 years ago. You know what I mean? So now a lot of people have it in their head where the '70s is 30 years ago. Is that fair, Dad? Yeah, well, that's a little more than that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually about 50 years old here. This topic, uh, but it's still one of our. I believe it is our most modern because technically the most modern one we did was a, a lost episode. We'll call it about the Bay of Pigs, which we'll probably try to put another one out for. But uh, we're hitting a wild topic today: a bloody fight on the streets of New York. And yet, uh, Bill the Butcher and gangs of New York are not involved, nor are the Sharks nor the Jets, Dad. There you or go. the right. Warriors. Or the Warriors. It's a <laughs> they, have not, they have decided to not come out and play. <laughs> and uh, uh, what's his name? The, the Escape from New York. We're not quite uh, we're oh. not in future. In Call escape. me Snake. <laughs> yeah. You mean snake my, Plissken. my hopeful hair twin? Is yeah, that what you guys are talking about? That's it. <laughs> I had to get a haircut. It was getting bad. Um, and almost that fits into the topic today, too. I had long hair for a little bit, man. And um, uh, But today's fight, like we said, no sharks, no jets, no T-birds, all right? No Arthur Fonzarelli's, the Lords. Um, mm. No grease lightning. Today's fight is between uh, what we're going to just, we're going to use clunky terms here to try to break it down. Because as you remember, on the very first episode of this show, we were trying to talk about Grover Cleveland's time frame and the concept of Republicans and Democrats existed then. But it wasn't exactly what we know the parties as right now. Uh, the same way that we're going to use this term, hippies versus plumbers, is today's episode. <laughs> okay? That's loosely what we're going to do. And by the way, quick shout out to uh, Joe Carney, who canceled on us three fucking times for this episode. Wow. Three times. Not, not once, not twice, but three. Come on, okay? Joe. What do they say in baseball, Cahoons? Three strikes, you're out, baby. All right? So Joe Carney put his name on the list. Now tear it out. You are no longer welcome. (laughs) Write his name down in the book. Now tear out the page. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then we were going to bring Joe Fernandez in, but uh, he canceled due to probably having a donut and then needing to take a nap from it. Um, Joe has diabetes, undiagnosed. Let's be honest, guys. (laughs) So entering into today's loser, the Hard Hat Riots in New York City, 1970, baby. Cahoons, have you ever heard of this? No. No, I don't think I have, actually. All right. Well, Captain Zeitgeist here to my right, old, <laughs> old South Beach Larry. <laughs> wow. Is, All right. Is going to unpack this here for us. Uh, Dad, lots of, there's a lot of stuff going on in America, specifically in the New York, New Jersey area in 1970. Wow. So, uh, first of all, where was South Beach Larry at this time? Uh, in 1970? You know it. He was uh, going to that highly acclaimed Institute of Higher Education known as Trenton State College. Oh. Back in the day when guys like me could still get into Trenton State College, and now they're calling it the College of New Jersey, and guys like me would not be able to get in there. But and the- and uh, Uncle Bobby, uh, the uh, my father's oldest brother, has the best line, Cahoon. I, I think this is quality. Um, whenever they send him alumni letters asking for donations uh, from the College of New Jersey, he always writes back, but I didn't go to the College of New Jersey. I'm from Trenton State. You have the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, that was a uh, – it's a Burke uh, uh, thing that uh, all three of us, uh, my, my two older brothers and I, we all went to uh, Trenton State, and we all became industrial arts teachers, which uh, is loosely called shop teachers. But, uh, yeah, there's a genetic flaw there somewhere. But <laughs> <laughs> you it is what a, it is. You have that engineering quality to you. There and, you uh, go. And by we also – Hands-on doing stuff. Yeah, well, uh, you're not covered in as much of it as I am because I had to hold um, – I'm not as I'm not skillful at all with this stuff. I can I can hang on a job site. I don't screw anything up, but I'm not good that way. We were hanging dry uh, drywall all day today at uh, my new place in Old Bridge, and um, LP was just doing the work, man. And uh, so you're 1970. You're attending Trenton State. What's going on in the nation? In the nation, because uh, you're of a certain age at this time. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things going on. I mean, we just came out of the 60s, if you will. So you have the uh, the counterculture that has now become labeled as the hippies. Um, you have um, all kinds of civil rights demonstrations going on. It wasn't more than two years ago, be- prior to uh, this event of the hard hat riot where we're having rioting in the streets 
Um, we have a this number. Happens, the, the whole events today happened within the span of a month. Not to cut you off, but just to, to say that's how fast shit was moving oh, around this time Leading frame. up to it, yeah. But, I mean, the, the 10 years or the decade leading up to it, oh, yeah. there's, all, there's all kinds of things going on. I mean, we have the, uh, the draft lottery is reinstated from the first time now since before uh, the Second World War. That's because I'm asking is that you're a um, you're of that age at this time. You absolutely, would, would have been of absolutely. draft age. That's, absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm of draft age. My first year in college, I was a freshman. I was a young freshman, so I was not involved with the first lottery, which took place on December the first in 1969. Um, what was the the lottery? Um, there will be tablets put into this big hopper. It's almost like a a giant bingo game kind of a thing. Uh, 365 days of the year, um, and that w- they would be drawn out, and those would be the first guys that would, if your birth date fell on that particular capsule, if you will, um, you would be number one in the in the draft, and then so on, two, three, four, as they were pulling these various dates out of the hopper. Um, at that time. If you were probably under 150, real good chance that you're going to be sent off to Vietnam. You're going to be drafted and sent off to Vietnam. So the Vietnam is is raging. Um, we've been involved with Vietnam since the uh, Eisenhower administration, really, followed by the Kennedys, and now we're into Johnson. And by 1970, we now have... Uh, President Nixon. Well, why do we care about these <coughs> countries on the other side of the world? Is there some sort of a, a perhaps a, a, a fear mongering type of tactic, or a little people getting nervous about some stuff going on over there? Well, some political unrest, perhaps. Yes, I mean that, that's really hard to look at 1970, just as 1970, and how how could people be so polarized without backing it up a few years? Um, and that really goes back to the close of the of the Second World War, where um, the Soviets are taking over uh, Eastern Europe. So you have all these the commies, the communists are taking over uh, a good chunk of uh, Europe. There's a, a huge fear that this whole communist thing is going to continue to worldwide. Uh, as a U.S. citizen, we've um, we have seen communism spread throughout. Um, right into you know 90 miles off our, our shores with uh, with Cuba and Castro that uh, he was he was getting Soviet backing. Um, a, as a kid going through grammar school, uh, we're also going through a thing called the Cold War. That as a grammar school kid, you're taught how to duck and cover. That was the the big thing that you know the the Soviets were going to be dropping nuclear bombs on us. And the nuclear arms race was fully, fully on. The Cold War was just a, wasn't really a shooting war, but it was an escalation of, of, uh, of armament all over the world between the Soviets and the United States or the uh, allies of the United States. We see all kinds of stuff going on in, uh, in Africa, in the, in the Congo. Um, I mean, there was flashpoints all over the globe. Um, Back it's weird because we already had the war that ended all wars. Though, Dad. That's <laughs> yeah, kind of well, weird. We had two of those. I mean, we, <laughs> the the war the war to end all wars was the first world war, and we didn't really put a number on that until the second world war broke out, mm-hmm. and then the war to end all wars or the great war now became the first world war, and then we have a second world war. And as I say, these various uh, superpowers are dividing up the globe with. Uh, you know, the, the democracy versus uh, versus um, communism. So there's a, a huge, uh, huge anti-communist feeling. Uh, we got McCarthyism going through uh, the 1950s. Who will be another episode of this show. A uh, couple, couple people have messaged me and asked. Who is accusing, you know, he, he was a senator that's accusing um, Americans of being communist defectors, if you will, um, in uh, the space race is going on. There's a nuclear arms race going on. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first uh, satellite called Sputnik, and that was a huge uh, game changer for the whole space race because now there's a huge fear that these Soviets are going to be putting these satellites 
up in the sky that they'll be able to drop bombs on us from from outer space. So we better start playing catch up. Uh, put the first man in space too. Uh, they they certainly did put the first you man in space. Name? So we were we were. Uh, uh, no, I can't remember. Yuri A. Gagarin. Yeah, thank you. Gagarin. I did a report yeah, on him in fourth right. grade. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, but, you know, there's a, a space race. Um, Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower, who was a very popular president. I mean, he was the guy that was in charge of the Allied forces for the Second World War. So he's a returning war hero. Uh, and they put him up for a nomination and easily wins the presidential election. Um, that was your favorite president, by the way. If you remember, I had to interview you for a college class to ask you who your favorite president was. I don't president. remember that, but... You said, uh, you said Ike. You were, <laughs> Ike? You, I was a little kid. What, what do I know about You Ike? credited him for the uh, the, the highway uh, the Oh, yeah, but the inter system. interstate highway so. system. Yeah, but Ike, I mean, one of the big things with our interstate highway system with Ike was... Uh, he could see as a uh, you know, the commander in chief, if you will, from during the Second World War, the need for greater transportation. And actually, the interstate highway system was developed so that you could land planes on on the interstate if need be as an emergency <laughs> airstrip. So I mean, he was he was no fool. But but prior to that, I mean, during the Second World War, the best way of transport was aim by for south of the border. We're going down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going down to the Florida. We'll aim for the uh, south of the border stop off. But uh, um, but that Sputnik thing again back in '57 that was huge. That that really got people riled up. That we gotta we gotta beat these commies to outer space. Uh, Kennedy is elected. Um, he prompt he, or he vows that you know we're gonna we're gonna win this space race, and not because it's easy, but because it's hard, and we're gonna put. A man, you know, we're going to be the first to put a man on the moon. So, you know, well, a lot, a lot of money is spent on that. Kennedy is assassinated in 1963. Uh, we had, uh, uh, well, we had a Cuban before before Kennedy really comes in. There's a Cuban revolution in '58, um, which puts Castro in charge. You know, he over overtakes the U.S. backed government um, in in Cuba. Um, so now he's a revolutionary that takes over Cuba, and, and he's a, a dictator um, in 58. So the if U.S. Only the backed, Mets had just signed him. To huh? that, if only the Mets had signed him. You know, he was a prospect, right? <laughs> yeah, he you was. Think about how many, he was a pretty decent baseball player. How many player. lives could be different? Right. If the, the Mets just really ruin everything. It's <laughs> Kennedy tries to overthrow um, the newly formed Castro government. Uh, with a, a boondoggle called the, the Bay of Pigs where they were taking uh, Cuban exiles and training them and they were going to invade, uh, invade Cuba and take it, take it back. And that was a, a boondoggle of the worst kind. Uh, that leads up to the Cuban Missile Crisis where now the Soviets are bringing their missiles and putting them in place in, um, in Cuba, which would have been able to strike uh, most of the eastern part of the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. I mean, holy crap, and it's only 90, 90 miles off our shore. Mm -hmm. Kennedy is assassinated in 1963. So, I mean, it, it's rough times. There's, there's great achievements. Um, you know, Kennedy brings in the Peace Corps to try to uh, bring that. I mean, there's a lot of firsts. That there was a whole wave of uh, spirit of... of you know, helping out the rest of the world with the Peace Corps and everything else that we were going to win the rest of the world over to democracy by what we can do for people rather than uh, the totalitarian government of the Soviets. Um, Kennedy is assassinated in 63. Um, there's a whole uptick in civil rights movements. Martin Luther King is making... Uh, making some drastic uh, moves forward. Martin Luther King... Um, we got to address the one thing here, too. Cahoon is wearing an MLK shirt right now, too. So well, for, for those who can't enjoy the, well uh, the visual <laughs> side of it. Well yeah. done. Keep going, though. I'm sorry. Uh, Not purposeful, by the way. <laughs> in 63, Martin Luther uh, King leads a march on Washington. That's where his famous I Have a Dream speech is given to over 100,000 people. So, I mean, you know, there's there's... 
a lot of civil unrest on the home front and at the same time we now have this war in Vietnam that's escalating and really getting out of control. Uh, Kennedy, in order to back the French government, um, tries to help out the French. By the way, for those who don't know, um, Vietnam, French uh, colony, if you will, at a time. And then also the French had, uh, they had their issues with um, boots on the ground trying to fight uh, the uh, what would eventually become the NVA. So we're not going to give a, a, a whole, um, I don't want to give away some future topics here too with a, a couple things that we've mentioned, but uh, Vietnam is the, the kicker at the time. Now you gave me this one stat that always stood out to me as a kid on one of our car rides back from Grammy's <laughs> house last Sunday. All right. Sitting in the back of a Mercury station wagon. There you, you know, go. Looking into oncoming traffic. That's how you always want to see it as a little kid, you know, hoping people stop. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, we had one conversation where you were telling me, because I asked you, I said, if you did you think about joining the military? And you said that you had some feelers out there, and you spoke to a couple of people maybe. And But there was one thing that um, this draft would, would really screw people up with. First of all, if you couldn't, it was low-income kids that were getting sent over for the most part that couldn't get out of the draft. But now also uh, ULP, it's always interesting to me because um, – you pointed out that you said, well, I could either go in, I could either leave college and go in, and I'd be a grunt, you know what I mean? You go in as enlisted, which is what I was in the Navy, or you could finish your degree and then go in as an officer. But the NVA, the, the, you know, the, the forces we were fighting against in Vietnam, uh, they were so, they were a smart enemy and they were fighting, this, they were very good at guerrilla warfare, that you once told me that uh, engagement time uh, for an officer, if you were coming in as a second lieutenant and you had that bar on the back of your helmet, right. That was, you might as well have painted a bullseye. Right. Kill the officers, um, and then the, the grunts kind of lose. Okay. So the an officer gets killed quicker. It's essentially how you right, broke it down. Right. They're, to the first, they're the first to go. You're yeah. going to you're gonna be the number one, the prime target. I mean, even in that movie, um, Forrest Gump, uh, Forrest comes in to Vietnam, and he, and he salutes uh, Major Dan's. And Dan's Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan. Damn it, Dan. And they, uh, <laughs> He just rips him a new one. Don't you ever friggin' salute me because you never know who's who's watching uh, oh, yeah. and trying to figure out who the officers. The officers were walking around just as regular enlisted guys because they didn't want to be mm -hmm. a target. That even goes back to, to Grant during the Civil War. Grant is often photographed in like a private's uniform because he didn't want to have uh, <laughs> any, any uh, decoration on his uniform to... Uh, show a potential sniper that, hey, that's the, that's the big cheese. And meanwhile, you know, Robert E. Lee, uh, I have, where's my red sash? I yeah. need my red sash. It matches my horse, damn He's it. My, you know, you pick out the officers, shoot the officers first. Yeah, but uh, that, that was, uh, things were not going well. I mean, Vietnam is, is a whole topic unto itself. I mean, we can go on and on forever. There's lots of little segments for loser down the road. Just very quickly... France imposes a colonial system on Vietnam in 1887, so we're going way back when, in the, in the colonial period. Uh, there's a guy, uh, a Vietnamese national, uh, you might have heard this name before, Ho Chi Minh. Um, oh, he won last comic standing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that's Dat Fan. Dat yeah. Fan, I'm thinking that. <laughs> uh, Ho Chi Minh is a Vietnamese national, and now he wants to liberate his country from the French. I mean, the French are imposing colonial rule on them. He goes off to the Soviet Union in the 1920s to become a, a communist, if you will, because they're, the, they're willing to help, help them out. Um, because France is really a, a democratic type of government, so uh, the communists are against the French. Uh, Ho Chi Minh finds the, uh, founds this Indo-Chinese Communist Party um, 1940 rolls around, Nazi Germany invades France, so France is not able to defend its uh, colonies. So the Japanese, who are allies with the Germans, uh, invade Vietnam. So now the Vietnamese have been fighting the French, then they were fighting the Japanese who took over their country. So... By the way, if These you're at home and you're confused, you should be. None of this shit makes any sense. It's it's this is wild times. Yeah, it, it's wild times. So I mean, but it, it 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 is all factors into how we got in, embroiled into the Vietnam War because we promised that we were going to help out the French, 
after the war, um, the at a Geneva Accords, Vietnam is divided in half. There's North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Why? Well, and then a, a promise that there was going to be democratic elections so that the Vietnamese people could figure out on from on their own <laughs> as to which way they were going to go. Eisenhower gave a little speech when he was in office um, that was termed the domino theory, that it was by Eisenhower's opinion, and it was a very popular opinion, that if we allow the communists, um, you know, if, without bucking the, the communist kind of a thing, that they're going to take over, that if Vietnam falls, then Laos is going to fall, then Cambodia is going to fall, and then all of Southeast Asia is going to fall. So that if one government start, starts to topple and starts to go to the communist side, that then they're, they're all going to go communist. So in order to fight that, Eisenhower promises that they're going to help out um, South Vietnam because Ho Chi Minh is now in the north. That The North Vietnam is going to be communist, and South Vietnam is going to be democratic with U.S. backing, uh, that that first uh, that ho- first government, if you will, um, very very shaky. As a matter of fact, I think they had twelve different, with various military coups and everything else, they had like twelve different regimes within South Vietnam within a very short period of time, within like maybe six years. It was like, uh, you know. Who's 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 on uh, well, whose batting order is it today? Well, it sounds um, complicated, so that's probably why uh, it wasn't um, a resounding popular thing here stateside, and maybe why a certain college age Larry Burke was debating whether or not to get involved. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then you have a draft lottery going on that uh, people were going to be uh, called up to join uh, join in in the fun in, in uh, Vietnam. Very unpopular. Um, Questions? Do you have any friends that uh, get drafted? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Neighborhood kids, I know you told me that much. That's, and what you were speaking of earlier, too. Now, here I am, you know, Freddie Freshman in college. And at that point, the war was not going real well for, for us by any stretch of the imagination. And things just keep escalating and escalating. That um, I think it hit over 500,000 guys were now in uh, South Vietnam through the various military buildup, and they're still looking for more. And things were not going. The more we build up, um, the stronger and stronger it seems that the Viet Cong or the the communist forces fighting against us are getting. Um, we still don't know the the number on the uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, enemy combatants that were killed. That's how much of a chaos, shadow war yeah, kind of but, a thing it was. Um, you know, Ho Chi Minh and, and then his his followers, the ones his uh, predecessors. Um, they just kept coming and coming and coming, and these people wanted, you know, wanted to be their own their own country. But, um, you know, and it, um, as I said, between sixty three and sixty five, so within like two years' time, there was twelve different governments take the lead in South <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> holy so, I mean, shit! Holy crap! Right? Um, and yet we're still going in there and trying to support <laughs> the latest government. Uh, as long as you promise that you're going to be democratic, you know, we're going to continue to back you and pouring in, you know, how many lives were lost um, um, and money spent on this. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, Kennedy is killed. Kennedy is assassinated. Johnson takes over. And now you got a president that's trying to fight, win a war in Southeast Asia, and at the same time, he's got a lot of troubles on the home front. It seems like everybody is protesting. I mean, the blacks are protesting. The Indians are taking over Alcatraz that they're protesting um, for their rights. There's, uh, there's the— When you say uh, Indians, too, you're talking about the— uh, uh, I'm AIM. sorry, the Native American— Well, no, specific because there's a group called AIM, the American Indian Movement, that was right. big on that stuff, too. The, uh, the American Indian Movement. I think there was 17 different tribes that were involved with that, but they took over Alcatraz as unused federal land, that they, they were taking that back um, because of all the broken promises that the U.S. government had given the Native Americans over the years. Um, in 64, um, the North Vietnamese allegedly attack a, or a, 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 a patrol of torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin that give Johnson, who is now the president, taken over after 
after uh, Kennedy. Um, well, during Kennedy's presidency, I believe we were assisting in training the response to the NVA. Yeah, I, that's true. Uh, in, under Kennedy's administration, we were really military advisors, um, what I believe was the term that they used. Um, we didn't really have ground troops in there until uh, a couple years later. I believe uh, in 65, we finally have the first Marines land on the beaches uh, near Da Nang in South Vietnam, the, the first American combat troops to enter Vietnam. So it's almost so, like a so coronavirus in a way, where you, you hear about it on the news, you know, <laughs> and you're like, all right, whatever, that doesn't really affect me. And then all of a sudden now people you know are getting involved in this thing. Right. Send in the Marines. So uh, Johnson calls in for more ground troops, and we're increasing the draft uh, now to like 35,000 guys a month, a month. So... That's a that's a huge call up. Cahoons, how old are you right now? I always forget. Twenty four. Twenty four. Okay. But, you'd be uh, you'd be draft. You would be draft eligible for sure. So you'd be um, turning on the news every night to find out if uh you know your birthday popped up. So you finally hit the lottery. It's just not the one you wanted. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. The first the first draft lottery during the Vietnam era was in '69, and that was for anybody that was born between 1944 and 1950. LP missed that one because I was born in 51. So I was not part of the first draft lottery. But the second lottery, the following year, they have another lottery. Again, they pulling out all the names and they would go through who's eligible, who's not eligible. Um, but uh, for that one, the one that I was uh, involved with, old LP's number came up as number 39. So I would have been <laughs> absolutely all of drab khaki army uh, if if I were not in college. You know, there yeah, was a deferment. I'd be, uh, I'd be half Asian, too, if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there would be, uh, um, because I was in college and because I was in a course of study to become a teacher, um, I had what, what they called a, uh, a uh, deferment. It was 2S. In other words, you were a student and you were studying to be something that um, was eligible to draft on. It doesn't mean that I was f totally forgiven. It meant that if I dropped out or flunked out, I'm going to be drafted. Or <laughs> if, and, and you're laughing, but there's a lot of it's guys that pressure. were- It's good pressure. There was man. a lot of guys in school that had no, <laughs> no, no great aspirations of coming away with a college degree. But if it kept my ass out of Vietnam, they were going to, they were going to study hard and stay in school. Be cool. Stay in school was, uh, you know. <laughs> How long have you been at this school? Oh, seven years. Yeah, that's right. 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 <laughs> and called the actors. Time, but man. there, there was a, uh, you had to, to be in order to maintain your student deferment eligibility, you had to take so many courses, uh, credits and, and pass and everything else. If you flunked out, you're, you are now eligible for the, for the draft. Um, you know, they'll be notifying your draft board about your newfound eligibility for, uh, to serve uh, Uncle Sam. They wouldn't even give you, like, a chance to, like, look for a different school? Oh, no, 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 or no. Like, no. You're one and done. Really? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And a lot, of pe a lot of people were bolting off to, uh, uh, to Canada. They would escape. And, you know, I'm not going to report to my draft board, which is a criminal offense. And they would... Um, you know, go go live in Canada, get out of the country. Do you know I mean, anyone it, that did that? I mean, Jesus. some of the some of the uh, stories. Bill <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of our famous politicians were uh, were part of that process. And then the the wildest one is too. Uh, what's his name? I can't believe I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, but he served on the uh, on the river boats. Um, so, Kerry. Yeah, John Kerry. So he the, the, you got there's a whole mix all around with that stuff, man. It's now the other move too. If you talk to World War II veterans, um, they, when they knew that there was going to be a draft, majority of the well, people would tell you, because, you know, my grandfather, you know, Marty Boyajan, he waited till he was drafted, right? He was also young, too. But a lot of other young men around his age would say, well, I'm not going to wait to get drafted. I'm going to pick the branch I want. I'm going to pick the job right. I want. We hear so right. much of that with um, the Easy Company boys in the 101st. But now the wild thing is, if you're watching what's going on on the news here, and it doesn't seem like it's really a great time over there. It's not exactly the righteous fight of punching back at Japan post Pearl Harbor or fighting Nazi Germany. Um, now, do you really want to sign up for something? Maybe you'll take your chances and just hope your number doesn't come up. Right. So that's kind of wild here. By the way, a couple little um, 
pop culture references just for some people to, to know what we're dealing with here. Uh, I'm not jumping forward in 1970. That is the events we're talking about today. Okay. But we're doing that awesome background that you're setting up, and, and I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's hard to jump into today's topic without oh, you having an understanding the, of the what, where the country was at. Oh, yeah. I mean, people say today that we're polarized. Yeah, well, you should have been, <laughs> you should have been back in the 60s with the polarization that, you know, if, if, you, were, if you had long hair, you were automatically labeled as a hippie, and you were one of those peace love commies, right? That the other side, because you're dealing with a population that there's a lot, a lot of people that just, you know, risked it all with the Second World War and Korea. Don't forget Korea and, and Korea, right? That, that they answered their country's call to save, you know, save America, save democracy, if you will, from the from the Nazis and stuff. And now we're trying to fight back the, the commies, right, the communists. And now this whole thing is going around worldwide in the Congo, in the Vietnam, in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, they're, they're taking over Poland and Czechoslovakia and everything else. Um, so there was a, a very large part of the, of the population. It's, it's, you know, America, God damn it. My country, right or wrong, you're, you're going to go in and defend America. And if our leaders tell us that we should be in Vietnam, God damn it, you know, we're yeah. going to go in there. And nothing makes you realize that you have a, a country that's doing pretty good when uh, you're also watching uh, Nuremberg trials go on post-World War II to, to remind you, oh, yeah, there's such a thing as the good guys. Right, right. So, And, but, and that whole media thing, too. Now we've, we have a war for the first time that's coming home to everybody's living room on TV on the 6 o'clock news. So you can see, you know, you can see embedded, you know, the term during the Gulf War became embedded journalists. Well, you know, you've got um, uh, Morley Safer and, and uh, uh, Cronkite and everybody else act- Talking live while the while the bullets are and whizzing past you. The power of that too, I believe. The quote was, may, "I want to say it's attributed to Nixon, um, who is president during the time frame we're talking about of the event today." But uh, the line was, uh, "Once I lost concrete, I uh, con- Con- yeah, concrete, I knew I had lost uh, the nation." So that's how th- these guys are presenting yeah, to you. Here's yeah, footage. he was he was media gospel for sure. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. And, uh, but another pop culture reference for you though too, just because I got to keep. Um, we got to keep the kids at home happy. Um, so 1970 is the year we're talking about here. You got Vietnam. You got Nixon in the White House. Jackson Five, I want you back, is trending on the billboards right now, flirting with I think number one at the time. Uh, best picture that year, 1970. Any idea, Cahoons? 1970. 1970. It's a weird one. It's the only X-rated movie to ever win best picture. <laughs> oh crap! Uh, it's not uh, John Voyette. Dustin Hoffman. And he, here's the tie-in that you're going to love, by the way. So it was Midnight Cowboy, and they were oh. playing male prostitutes, okay? So it's technically an X-rated film, or NC-17 film, I should say. Um, but it won Best Picture. And Dustin Hoffman's character is named... Uh, uh, hey, Kahuna? Riz, Rizzo Rat was no, his name. Are you serious? And that is what Rizzo the Rat was named yeah, after. That's and Rizzo. he had the line where... Uh, they're walking on the streets in New York, and a taxi pulls up, and it almost hits him. And Hoffman slaps the taxi and goes, I'm walking here. Oh, my that is right. where Rizzo the Rat came right. from for uh, Jim Henson's Muppets. <laughs> I love how you just threw that in, thinking, like, let's get Kahuna back into the conversation. I know how to bait you, brother. <laughs> I also, because we got so much going on here, too. This is, uh, uh, and again, firsthand resource, LP. And then also, uh, I mean, this was, we got, there's a lot of highlighter on these pages, yeah, there, baby. There's, there's a lot of animosity going on. All over with there's not not a whole lot of people that are real happy with uh, the way things are going kind of a thing. But you've got people that are defending, you know, again, it's my country, right or wrong, but it's still my country. Uh, there's other people that are saying, this is bullshit, I'm out. And, you know, that they have then become known as the hippies. We've got the whole Woodstock culture type of a thing because Woodstock happened just prior to this. Um, the in band six, played in, at Woodstock. In 68... 67, 68 really became a turning point that these little uh, peace demonstrations uh, really started to get more and more powerful. Really kind of started on a lot of college campuses that, you know, we really don't belong in Vietnam. Um, We should get out. Well, in 67, 68, there is a major battle called Khe Sanh that went on for uh, 77 days uh, where the 
these weren't just guerrilla warfare. This was the big time armies against armies type of a thing. And then uh, the the uh, the sinker was uh, the Tet Offensive in '68 was a, a huge turning point in a lot of popular opinion because they were able to uh, the the communists were able to have a synchronized attack on over a hundred different cities in South Vietnam at the same time. Uh, that was huge. That you know somebody's pulling some strings here to make make sure that uh, yeah, an these operation aren't, um, of that scope these aren't the pygmies right yeah <laughs> this isn't somebody out in the out in the bush just uh, sniping at us this is big time uh, things uh, in 68 in February of 68 in one week uh, records of the highest number of US soldier deaths during the war was 543 American deaths in one week public opinion is starting to starting to shift I would say, I would estimate it, it was probably like a 50-50 kind of a thing by various Gallup polls and stuff that were taken at that time. Oh, yeah. That, you know, somewhere around half the people are saying, we got to get the frig out of there. And the other half is saying, hey, we didn't come in here and have all these guys die for nothing, that we're going to take this to the finish. It wasn't really about what was right or wrong. But well, a line two you are we gonna told finish me it? was um, that uh, a lot of the public opinion at the time was, well, we should be fighting communism uh, overseas rather than in our backyards. So that there was the idea that we'll stop them here in Vietnam. That way we don't have to deal with it right. when they're trying to, you know... Uh, Meanwhile, we still got right Cuba there. in our <laughs> backyard and uh, Che Guevara is now trying to stir up things in South America and everything else. So, I mean, are, are, we, are we ignoring our, like you say, our, our backyard... Why do we need to go all the way across to the other side of the world to uh, Southeast Asia? Yeah, to you don't want to poke your head out one day and be like, man, the neighborhood's gone to shit. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so there's one particular event that, that spurns all this, or, or, or spurns maybe is not the right word, the, the genesis point for today's topic. So I don't want to say it because everyone's going to know it for the most part as soon as they hear it, but is there any other background you want to give before we hit that, that infamous thing that perhaps there's a very famous song about by one Neil Young? Oh, yeah, well... Johnson sees the war is not going well for us, and he's and Johnson, President Johnson, starts to see public opinion starting to go against this. The American deaths are mounting, and everything else, and he vows that he's not going to run for re-election. You know that if nominated, he assumed the office. Huh? He assumed the office at, upon the death of Kennedy. For those that don't right, know, right, okay. right. But he does. He's not going to run for re-election, um, and um, really a, another uh, peace candidate. Uh, McCarthy, uh, not McCarthy. Oh God, I'm losing it. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. I worked you hard today, dude. Apologies. Um, uh, Johnson is not going to run for re-election. Uh, Richard Nixon, who was Eisenhower's vice president, is running for for election and wins in '68. So the November election of '68, Richard Nixon comes in. He's the new um, he's the new president. He runs on a campaign promise of law and order because the country is going to pot. We've had all kinds of uh, race riots. We've had all kinds of demonstrations. We've got all kinds of uh, war um, war protesting going on in various college got campuses. New Jersey tie in here, by the way. I promised to to not be corrupt and be an asshole, as I obviously do not have my hands tied behind my back. <laughs> See, this is where Kahuna's got him from the pop culture, because that's how he's remembered. But also, t real quick, our only Jersey tie-in today that I think we had, buddy, only? is really? the only one we have for this is, because it all takes place in New York, the event we're going to cover. But uh, the only Jersey tie-in would be one of those infamous riots that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. The, the Newark riots. Yeah, but that wasn't just in Newark. That was a, a, across Global. the country. But the, the Got down to St. Augustine, Florida. The two most... Uh, damaging riots, the, the worst um, teardowns, if you will, was in Detroit and our own Newark, New Jersey. Um, yes, sir. They were, they were the, the two most damaging riots that took place. Um, so anyhow, where the heck are we? Uh, he promises— Nixon, uh, is, is coming in. So, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the old schools are seeing this is that Nixon is running on a promise um, that he's going to end the draft— so he's, he's trying to pull that one off, and he's also going to restore law and order. Then we're not going to have all this rioting in the streets, and we're going you know, to go in there and break some heads if need be, but we're going to restore law and order. 
um, which became a very, you know, it still remains today that law and order is a, is a top a topic that everybody hopefully can get behind kind of a thing. So anyhow, uh, he runs on that and wins in 69, all right, so uh, 68. Now in 69, things are still not going real well, but in May of 69, uh, secretively, uh, although he, he ran on a promise of scaling back the war, he goes into Laos because Laos, La- I think, Laos, depending on how La- you want to call it. So just a couple of Jersey kids here yeah, trying to sorry. talk history. So what we read good, you? but we don't talk no good. No, that's right. Mm-hmm. I don't learn that Isn't goody. that part of the charm? <laughs> that goodly English. Laos, um, now Laos was bordering Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese were using that neighboring country as kind of a thoroughfare, although they were technically neutral. Right. They were um, allowing the North Vietnamese to come down and resupply and bring troops and everything else on something that was known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So in order to try to stop this, and they were also setting up uh, um, camps in Laos um, that would then go into South Vietnam and attack South Vietnam from from the neighboring country. Although again, that's the civility handcuff, if you will, of, a, of right, our attempting right. to fight a clean war with a guerrilla type a guerrilla uh, warfare. Yeah, right, so it got, ain't gonna go good. Right, now, not everybody's playing war, but with by uh, the same rules. Um, so um, Nixon orders um, bombers to go in and, and try to knock out some of these things. Uh, in May of 69, and then uh, uh, actually he then secretively sends in troops in, into Vietnam, uh, excuse me, into Laos. Um, and now what is he doing? He's not scaling back the war in Vietnam. He's broadening the war in Vietnam. And although there have been a lot of different um, um, Peace demonstrations and everything else prior to that, that just sets people off once again. Oh, yeah, big now time. we're bombing a country that's not even involved. Yeah, it's and it's not a hard, hard, uh, I'm sorry, right. it's not a hard headline to write. Now, if you want to go into the nuance of the whole situation, that's where, again, everybody's always wrong because people get emotional. And as soon as you uh, attach emotion, you remove logic, and then people are getting pissed off on both sides. So it's like you said. Um, but right. uh, So we're, we're bombing Laos, and then in. Uh, um, April and uh, April through June of 1970. Actually, it started in April. U.S. and South Vietnam forces attacked communist bases across the Cambodian border. So now he's also going into Cambodia. So um, you know, we're not shrinking the the war in Vietnam. We're expanding the war in Vietnam. And there's a very large demonstration in Kent State. Um, he said it. We waited. We, we tried to milk it. How far in did we get? We almost got. I'm sorry. We're at least. 30 something minutes until we no I wanted you to say it but we wanted to milk this because as soon as we talk about this it lends itself right to the into, topic right. All so, right so Kent State you think that's enough background then Neil Young All right, four yeah. dead in Ohio All right, that's, the, that's the words to the song that uh, National Guardsmen uh, are, are called in to put down the, the demonstration that was going on at Kent State uh, that really was in protest of Nixon sending in um troops into Cambodia. Um, now, this anti-war demonstrators, they certainly did get out of hand, there's no doubt. Well, I, if I can, if I can yeah. just break down one thing real quick, because I, I want to hit this part, but I also I want to play up the caricatures of it, Cahoons, because there, there's so many people um, that, uh, again, I, like I said, as soon as you get an emotional attachment, you tend to pick a side, but you don't have to pick a side. So here's how they look at it. Whenever you don't like somebody, you uh, look to their lowest common denominator, and you judge the entire group based off of a, almost a caricature of their negative qualities. Mm-hmm. So in this particular instance, um, there are some really uh, well-intentioned, uh, hyper-intelligent people that are protesting the war saying, hey, I don't... So it's almost a libertarian standpoint of that. But if you can find, like, the uh, the drum circle hippie kids, hey, man, I don't, I'm not going to go fight from... No way, dude. I'm staying right here, man. 
you find those guys and you're going to piss off the people who are in support of the war. Now, those people who are the hyper-intelligent people who are getting yelled at and called cowards for not wanting to fight a war that they don't feel justified in are going to sit there and they're going to say, oh, well, let me guess, you're that, you're that classic racist bus driver or something like that. That's what you are, right? So they start developing these uh, misnomers, if you will, about the two opposing sides on it. So now in Kent State, there are the really smart people trying to show uh, the power of peaceful protest. But there's also like a hacky sack tournament going on, man. You know, <laughs> dude, I heard the dead's going to come play. Is that true? Are the I dead heard it coming was true, here? man. It's, <laughs> it was going to be a great time. I wish Janice was alive, you know, to see it. <laughs> they were going to have Dr. Teeth and the alleged mayhem come through, too. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's the, uh, the Archie Bunker types on the other side. So if you really if you want to look for caricatures to get angry about there's plenty of foot here oh yeah so, absolutely kent state ohio absolutely. um a lot of the a lot of the things that really piss people off to public opinion on that too is uh nixon sent in these troops uh so he made this presidential decision of, of without notifying the secretary of state william rogers nor the defense secretary melvin laird dude that's what imagine by so. the way can <laughs> you find that out that um uh, Ming goes on Facebook to announce that the studio is closing, and you're like, I don't get a fucking heads up, and I don't get nothing. <laughs> At least let me sell this. Give me a clue. Yeah. Um, oh my god. Uh, and it Damn was it, Ming. I'm already mad at you. And you didn't even do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so people in his own cabinet, Secretary of State and the Defense Secretary, they didn't they didn't have a clue about this invasion until Nixon addressed the nation on television two days later. That's how they found out when they saw because Nixon on TV. The Kissinger yeah. really funny you couldn't have given me a house. little, just a little nudge or something, or <laughs> send me a text or something. Um, but anyhow, the, these these student protests at Kent State um, are getting out of hand, um, and then there's the peaceful the, aspect. Then the, there's a little property damage. Right. So a lot of the students go into town and they're tearing up the town. Um, the mayor of the town, the mayor of Kent notifies the governor and then the governor sends in the national guard the national guard shows up um and this was wasn't a one-day protest it was like on a on a friday or a saturday then sunday everything was kind of cool everybody was just kind of hanging out and chilling but then come monday um there was going to be a big uh, rally on monday the national guard comes in to try to break up the protest because it was deemed that it was an unlawful protest or an un unlawful assembly, and shots are fired. The, the National Guard By the way, turn they, and fire is, into the crowd. Uh, as a sign of aggression, too, I believe I did read that they attached bayonets. So uh, I'm not sure about that one. I believe I did read that one part correctly there. There was also uh, a lot of uh, interaction between um, – because there's almost – remember we talked about this uh, – well, we were talking about the episode. There's a little bit of a thing, too, where uh, when, when shots are fired, like you said, um, one of the uh, – some of the, the soldiers on the ground said that uh, there was a sniper rifle that uh, someone shot from, like, a window, which is literally almost mimics the exact same story that Paul Revere said that was used by President – future President John Adams to defend the British troops during the British – mass. I'm sorry, the Boston Massacre. The Boston Massacre, so, yeah. But, you know, the long and the short of it is uh, – Shots were fired into the unarmed students, you know, whether the, mm -hmm. a shot was fired from the other side oh, or yeah. not. But it ends up that uh, um, the protesters are fired upon. Four kids are left dead and nine are wounded. Uh, and then 13 there's a, shot in total. I uh, and then there was a, a, a very famous photograph that was actually taken by a student photographer of a girl kneeling over one of the dead. Um, that girl was only like 14 years old. She wasn't even a college student. That was the pisser. There was high school kids involved in these things, so that they because you, you wanted yeah, to be. That's the photograph. Yeah, Cohen pulled put it right up. up. You're right. on fire. By the way, one thing: um, the uh, events at Kent State that we're talking about took place on uh, May 4th, 1970. So whenever Mike Ming or Kahuna say "May the Fourth be with you," they're actually celebrating the death of the protesters. <laughs> 
I didn't know Dark what to do. I did. Jesus Christ, right. KP. Like, I don't even know where to go with that wow. one. Like, first off, right. you're an asshole. <laughs> Secondly, you. you're Thank an you. asshole. Right. In every sense of the word. Like, Jesus, please, man. Please. I can't even, like, art. I can't, man. That was bad. Please don't oh. blame the parents because I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Oh my god! Notice like the like I'll oh my god that actual moment of silence just killed my soul. That was a Facebook joke that I wrote years ago where it was a uh, um, uh, man walks up to uh, you know a coworker holding a lightsaber and he goes, "Hey, you know what today is, right? Uh, May the 4th. And he oh, goes, yeah. "You know what that means?" This right? he is goes, this is an old. I remember this joke yeah. too. The, uh, the anniversary of Kent State. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you motherfucker. So. These Sorry, are, folks. Anyhow, There's, we had to uh, let's come. Let's bring this we're back. In, we're in, sir. We're in. Uh, I got to keep a little levity here, man. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was getting dark there. Thank thirteen you for the dead. Comic relief. I'm sorry. Thirteen shot. Four there was dead. a thirteen second in, in over in just over thirteen seconds. Seventy shots are fired, and in uh, in all total, there was four Kent State students that were killed, and nine others were injured. Uh, Two of them, Schroeder, was shot in the back, as were two of the uh, injured. So there's all, some say that the National Guard were ordered to fire into the air. Um, some fired at them, obviously. But there was uh, nearly 70 shots fired in total. That photographer, John Philo, won a Pulitzer Prize for that famous photo of uh, the image of 14-year-old uh, Mary crying over uh, Miller's fallen body. Um, but... Heavy shit. That yeah, that that is a, as I say, a Nobel uh, pri- Pulitzer Prize winning uh, photograph that really became uh, the battle cry, if you will, of uh, not battle cry. That's the wrong, but like the raising of the flag of Iwo Jima. Uh, iconic. The, uh, no, iconic. It's, it's Thank a you rally very much. Cry. It's like yeah. Iconic. An iconic image of protest um, during the during the sixties. Um, now there's four kids that are killed. At Kent State, um, the next day, uh, back in New York, Mayor John Lindsay, a Republican, by the way, just Repo- to, not that those liberal, terms mean anything. Right, a liberal Republican. Um, not that we're getting political with this. Far from we're just because there, there's there's a lot of um, that thirty year migration we talk about on the show sometimes. But there's a lot of back and forth here. But totally. Anyhow, meanwhile, back in New York City. Uh, Mayor John Lindsay orders the flag to be lowered to half mast to uh, honor, if you will, the four four kids that were just killed at Kent State. Um, there's a lot of uh, animosity between the different factions. You know, who's pro-war, who's against the war, who's um, pro-black, who's against the civil rights movement. Uh, there, there's, you know. We say that we're polarized now, today. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> that's nothing new. We've had extreme polarization on a, on a lot of this stuff. Lindsay, Both sides have a lot you can understand, too, because you understandably, as a college student, don't want to get drafted into a war where you're questioning the motives and the need for. And then, uh, uh, like we said, there's the uh, that whole counterculture thing uh, is going to lend itself to the stereotype of the uh, some of the, the, the blue-collar workers, as we're going to talk about with the long-haired, often lackadaisical, ideological uh, pot smokers, who, uh, by the way, did create some cool fashion, undoubtedly the greatest rock music ever, a couple of really great movies, some great literature, uh, you know, you got um, all sorts of cool stuff coming out of this time frame, but uh, a lot of iconic figures, too. However, the world is not exactly all hate Ashbury at this time. Uh, it's not all Janis Joplin and Flower Power. There's still blue-collar America to consider, right, Dad? Uh, blue collar is, is still absolutely into uh, the mic if you can. I'm sorry. Um, blue collar is still absolutely uh, you know, the, the working guy. Um, they were not the the labor unions, if you will, were pretty much pro war because again, that's like old uh, old guard, if you will. Um, that it's my country, and especially when you start to have protesters um, burning the flag. That, it's all about that. That was a flashpoint. Yeah. That was mm-hmm. absolutely a flashpoint. That, as soon as you start burning the flag, then you're not you're not protesting. You're you're making a a statement um, about your country. You know, to some, all the all the government was doing was lying to us. That, you know, but the flag became the symbol, if you will, as to 
um, how people were fed up with uh, with what was going on with the government. But again, some people are actually leaving. Uh, one side would call them chicken shit because they're going off to Canada to avoid the draft. And the other side could be called uh, uh, chicken hawks because they were all of it in favor of the war but wouldn't go themselves. Right. So now real quick, uh, this break, we're talking about blue collar America real quick. Cause we're setting, we've set up the one side of this clash here because the clash is very quick, Coons. It's a very fast battle, if you will. Yeah. All right. It, uh, it lasts about as long as Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, the rematch. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, the unions in America have uh, been supporters of both major parties in the past, but uh, at the start of the unions, it would stem from this idea. Now, when I say this idea, we're going to think that it um, lends itself to um, almost a page out of the Communist Manifesto here, that the, quote, proletariat, you know, the working class people, should rise up against uh, the big business interests, if you will. So. Uh, back in the day, though, in order to form these unions originally, which here's your loser reception for the week, baby, all right? The Molly Maguires, perhaps? Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe a group of guys who, that was literally, that wasn't even workers' rights, that was human rights for them, because they were being starved out of their own towns. Um, so that was the whole thing there. So you could, um, the idea of this proletariat, like we're saying, it almost as a page out of Marx's book, but that doesn't mean that it's exclusively a communist idea, okay? So, but there's this weird thing that when it originally starts up, that uh, the political components of the machines back then was the Democrats were the working man's party, right? So that would be the laborers would tend to be Democrats, whereas big business, so the uh, uh, Carnegie and the J.P. Morgans uh, of the world are going to be, quote, the, uh, the, the big money uh, Republicans. So now in uh, 1970 here, to set this table, that's over 100 years after these early U.S. labor movements have started, the majority of the skilled labor union members in America are going to be what, Dad? Democratic. Well, uh, they, they lean but, that way, but, but there's an alienation going right, on. Right, because at, at, in this same period, there's almost like a, a reversal that um, Democratic pol- uh, politicos were really not favoring the labor unions. The labor unions became a very, very powerful uh, influence in U.S. politics. Um, so, again, to try to keep this Republican or Democratic, the labor unions yeah, were, were going to become a, a voting week, yeah. block. I had a voting block that was a very powerful uh, voting block. Uh, let's face it, that uh, if you can promise, if you've got 400,000 guys in your, in your union and you can promise that they're going to vote for a particular candidate, um, that's uh, a pretty positive uh, thing. I mean, The Irishman taught you a little bit that, um, yeah, what a great movie that was, right. Scorsese's Irishman, that um, just the way that Hoffa could deliver I mean, he was one of the most powerful men in the entire country. You and can he make was it the happen. Head of, head of the Teamsters. So. Right. So now we're back in New York City. Kent State has already happened. Um, if we rewind just a little bit and stay within New York City, Mayor John Lindsay is elected mayor of New York in 1965, and he's classified as a liberal Republican. And he pledges that he's going to take on these special interests, including the building and construction unions. Again, they're very powerful. Nothing could be built in New York City unless you're going through the through the unions. Damn it! Uh, yeah. Well, in the late '60s, um, um, a, there was a study made in the, by a New York City Commission on Human Rights in 1967. So we're only three years prior to the Kent State shooting. Now, all right. So in '67. They found that minority membership in the six most highly skilled building trades was only 2%, and that hadn't changed since 1960. So at all these civil rights demonstrations going on, you had the, uh, the Stonewall riots in New York City, with the, uh, which marked the start of the modern gay rights movement in the U.S. Uh, that was only the year before. Uh, you know, things, things are, are chaotic um, socially. Um, as I said, the Native Americans are right. There's, there's riots in our cities. There's a lot of uh, peaceful protests with uh, Martin Luther King, but of course they they shot him, so he's no, he's no longer in the in the picture at this point. It's because, that Patrice bit, the Patrice um, O'Neill bit. Anybody who tries to bring us together gets killed. Um, and as for that matter, they I mean they killed Robert. Uh, Robert Kennedy, too. I mean, mm-hmm. um, they had John Kennedy was assassinated in Texas. Uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in, in uh, California. And Martin Luther King was assassinated down in Memphis. So, you know, a lot of these leaders um, are being shot down. And there's all kinds of speculation as to 
who's behind that. That mystery still hasn't been fully solved. But uh, Lindsay comes in with, uh, you know, vowing that he's going to make some changes in there. Um, Lindsay is not a very popular, uh, not a very popular uh, mayor. Um, he issues a, an executive order that required city contractors to sign a non-discriminatory hiring action plan. Uh, at th this particular time, the unions are pretty much white middle class, uh, predominantly Irish Catholic. Um, that if you're you're not going to be you're not going to be breaking into the union unless you meet those those qualifications. Right, and keep in mind this is pre technically pre affirmative action. Which, by the way, for all the damage um, and all the the garbage you can throw at Nixon, I believe he is the president that first implemented affirmative action. So there's always some. Uh, there's always shades, if you will, to uh, the different characters here. So, but now, uh, the guy who's really controlling here comes the name drop for the week. All right, the, and the guy that's really controlling the unions in New York City at this time is a guy by the name of Peter J. Brennan. Now, Brennan is you know old school, uh, came up through the unions himself. Uh, he's a union man from start to finish. Is he a little patriotic, perhaps? Maybe he did something in his youth. Uh, yeah, he he fought in the Second World War, so I mean. He, he did his part, God damn it. You know, he... <laughs> submarine guy, Navy yeah, man. He was a Navy man in, in, the, in the submarine. So he wasn't, he wasn't a, a suit that was uh, dodging the... Or uh, some young, hippie, long-haired freak that was, you know, not trying to do his patriotic duty by serving his country. He served his country during the, the Second World War. So, I mean, there's generational divide there's a economic divide there's a racial divide there's i mean there's all kinds of divides going on here lindsay's administration stated that they wanted 4000 minority trainees as part of the of a plan uh and brennan counteracted that that you know if you're going to break into the unions they want no more than 1000 trainees um brennan is very much Pro Nixon, he's a pro Nixon supporter. Here's the weird part, though: registered Democrat his whole life, always supported Democratic candidates leading up to this. Up to this, but he felt but, that alienation coming uh, because the Democratic Party was starting to cater to interests outside of uh, the labor unions, outside so, of the, the, his people. Yeah, so now right. it, it's turning into a, a sense of tribalism, if you will. So, um, but yeah, he's now starting to have his, uh, his his conservative flirtation, if you will. And keep in mind, please, if you're listening at home. Um, we're not a political show. We never will be. Um, but we're using the terms that were used to identify the people at the times. It doesn't have the exact modern context that uh, some people want it to. And um, if you can't accept that, I don't know if this is the show for you. <laughs> yeah. But um, We try not to be political here. Yeah, but, but you got to lay the groundwork for this one. Because once we hit – and again, dude, it, it literally is um, – uh, you build up all of the first Star Wars kahuna until you have uh, Obi-Wan versus Vader in the first lightsaber battle ever. That's essentially what we're building up right now. But if you just start off with that lightsaber, I'd be like, what are these? I don't know. What's happening? Is it a sword? What is it? I don't even understand. Why are these? you got to build the epicness before you... So we're setting up for this this clash right here, baby. And uh, keep going, LP. All right. So um, Lindsay orders the flag to be flown at, at half-mast. Um, then there's a group of students, primarily college and high school kids, that are going to protest the war in Vietnam and to show support for the kids that were just killed in, at Kent State. And they, they, the numbers estimate of somewhere around 1,000 are going to be protesting down around Wall Street um, and going to go take it over to uh, City Hall. Now, not all protesters burned flags, but it did become common enough that the idea of a protest meant, well, these are the kids that hate America. Right. So and if you have long hair, they're, they're, that's your... your uh, oh, yeah. For every virtuous, good your... citizen who is sitting there speaking a, an essentially libertarian idea of we should have a non-aggression non principle, right. um, there was also, like we talked about here, it's like, dude, uh, I scored this acid, and um, I mean, I, I feel like we're at a rally right now, but I could be at my house by myself. <laughs> That's how strong it is. Yeah, and the long hair thing, too. I mean, uh, old school, you had a crew cut. I mean, that going through the 50s and early 60s, you had a crew cut. That was that was part the, of that was because you were the hairstyle. That, you, that yeah. was the hairstyle that you're wearing. But now you're getting into the '60s, and in, as a symbol of your protest, uh, what's the song? You're going to let your freak flag fly. That's uh, <laughs> your long hair. That's uh, 
<laughs> that's it, man. You're, you're, you're just freakifying. And that, that whole hippie thing really came out of the 1950s with the beat generation that we then later called the beatniks. So, uh, uh, Kerouac and all those. You know, all, all of that type yeah. of thing. The, uh, the uh, Bohemians uh, in Greenwich Village and then... Uh, How does it feel? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Bob Dylan. He's well, a, he's Dylan's, a the times they are a change. And right. that you, you're, he was writing right. to that group. That that's who was, that the music was for um, in a lot of ways. And then also uh, Neil Young specifically is writing about uh, the, the race, race riots that are going on in the country. He wrote about Kent State. I wonder how quickly, I should have looked that up before the episode, to see how quickly the song um, Ohio came out by Neil Young post the events of uh, Kent State, which would have been interesting here. But I do want to make one point, too. Protest is American. Your quality of protest can come under fire, though. So you could probably get these people to agree on either side of the aisle that Vietnam was being at least mismanaged, okay? But the second you start shooting college kids or burning American flags and storming campus buildings, you burn that bridge to the middle ground here. So they now see you as the opposition rather than the disenfranchised uh, other side of the argument. Right. So, I mean, now in New York City, you've got the, a lot of the labor unions are viewing any kind of uh, protest um, as something going anti-American. Um, you're, you're, you know, they're, they're linked with uh, the commies that... Uh, if you're protesting the war, that means you're a communist and you're pro-communist and we hate the commies. And, uh, you know, again, we fought and died for the Second World War to free ourselves from that. And uh, here we are now fighting a war in Vietnam. And you got people telling me that we, we should not be uh, fighting a war. That's just un-American type of a thing. My, my father fought for our country. You tell me my father's a piece. You know what I mean? That's yeah, kind of the exactly, attitude. By exactly. the way, Kahuna just looked it up. Uh, you want to talk about how quick that turnaround was? Yeah, that was, was a real quick. I was going to four months maybe. May, no, dude. No, 17 days. He had that shit days. out okay. immediately. Yeah, May 4th is the incident. Um, okay. I'm sorry, not May 4th. Um, yeah, 4th. Yeah, May 4th was the incident in 1970. And then May 21st, Kahuna just pulled up that that's when uh, that's Neil when Young put Neil out. Young put uh, out four actually, days. technically, that's a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song. Right. So, right. Um, which is, uh, I mean, that you've seen them live. You said that's a great show. Right. I mean, it, it, all the, the music no of the so times, that too, one, right. that... Uh, you know, uh, I'm a, I ain't no senator's son. That's, uh, you know, the, Credence, or, or, Credence yeah. Clearwater and uh, everybody else. That uh, There was, a, as I say, an economic divide. And going back to something you said earlier, too, I mean, a lot of the things that if you had uh, enough political influence or something, you, you could find your way out of the draft, just as we've always had that, you know, if you're a senator's son, you're not going to be forced to draft. Somebody's daddy or somebody will be pulling strings. Um, Grover, uh, trying to, to, trying to get into the National paid. Guard then was a major coup because at that point during the Vietnam War, they weren't selling, sending National Guard units over to Vietnam to fight like they were for the Gulf War and, and Iraq who, and Who everything got else. into the National Guard around that time frame? George W. Bush. George W. So. Bush. All right. Well, so, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of that, that uh, the people that were really serving over in Vietnam were... Um, uh, poor white trash, right? Poor whites, poor Southern whites especially, there was a very high percentage, an abnormally greater percentage of blacks that were serving in Vietnam than the, than the black population at the time, and uh, Spanish Americans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the coin of phrase here, Hicks, Spicks, and Nigs were the ones that were serving over in Vietnam. That's, that was by their own by the by their own uh nomenclature if you will <laughs> so well, that's why a good a really underrated vietnam flick is hamburger hill um and they they break down the whole thing about that where it was like we're uh, we're brothers here in the trenches but as soon as we go back stateside everybody's going to forget we know each other right. and that shit goes out the window um hamburger now, hill just for the lose, uh, listeners at home that was a major a major battle a 10-day battle that was uh, nicknamed Hamburger Hill by the journalists. Uh, brutal carnage on, on both sides, actually, but that was a, a, a major pitched battle in, in 69. So that was a major battle right before this whole Kent State thing. So things were not going well for the Americans in Vietnam. 
No, sir. Now, that brings us to the day of the event, okay? This is how fast... We talk about how quick Neil Young turns around a song on that one, Cahoons, but this shit happened even faster, my friend. And we are wrapping up here, I promise. Um, no, it's okay. No, it's a... By the way, Cahoon was really sad today when he came in. Then we got him laughing a little bit, and then, um, you know, he's... a. Uh, He's still not coming on to our side of the glass in this laboratory setting as we're being exposed to <laughs> Corona. Right. But, yeah, right. yeah know, that's not happening that's today, <laughs> but I'm here, man. I'm sorry. I apologize. There's, no, relax, buddy. You're all good, man. And you uh, you accommodate us, uh, accommodated us a bit today. So The topic's not exactly uh, laugh a minute either. No, the, no. We're going to sneak some jokes dying, in. But, yeah. I got jokes. Right. Uh, okay. So May 8th, you New York City. Now. It's uh, <laughs> the president of the Building uh, Construction Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York. Again, Peter J. Brennan. Not quite Tammany Hall, but still very powerful. Um, he is going to organize um, a counter-protest because it is announced shortly after Kent State that anti-war protesters are announcing that they are going to be organizing, you guessed it, a protest in order to commemorate the students who were killed, arguably murdered, uh, near City Hall in New York. So they're going to be right outside of Federal Hall. Um, Coons, if you could bring up, uh, do you know, uh, how familiar are you with New York, buddy? You know that, that statue of George Washington out in front of, uh, I think it's Federal Hall? So if you want, yeah, that, that one's, um, interesting, because that's where this shit all went down today. Yeah, they announced that they're going to hold it on the corner of uh, Broad and Wall Street. Okay. So right in the middle of, you know, economic, uh, ground zero, economy ground zero for the United States with Broad, uh, um, Wall Street. Yeah, it almost looks like uh, this should be the building that Bane comes out of at the end of uh, The Dark Knight Rises. Is so it you've come back to die with your city. The protest was formed really to demand an end of the war in Vietnam and now Cambodia. Into the mic, sir. Uh, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the protest was announced to to demand an end to the war in Vietnam. They had a cause, for and sure. And now Cambodia, because Nixon just put, put troops into uh, Cambodia. So he's going against his campaign promises. What a what a unusual set of circumstances for a, pol a politician to go back on what he promised during his, <laughs> during his campaign. But, uh, and the release of uh, political prisoners in the U.S. and an end to uh, military-related or, or research on all university campuses. Um, so this was announced, and they're forming up in Wall Street. And then about five minutes before noon, approximately 200 construction. Now, the crowd— well, well, Hang on, hang on real quick. I want to set up one thing. Okay. Because okay. and, 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 we're, we're getting good. The, now, you, you want to talk shit about the, the, quote, hippies, if you will, that they're lazy and everything? The protest started at 730 in the morning. Okay? And they're still there. Well, at 730 in the morning, they're, they're getting up and they're going. All right? And uh, mostly college kids, some high school kids— uh, the protest gets underway. Like you said, they had very clear uh, goals. They wanted the freedom of uh, political prisoners. They wanted uh, uh, a ban on military research on college campuses. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then they also uh, wanted, obviously, the end of the war in, in both Vietnam and Cambodia, as you said. So now, uh, as their numbers are nearing the thousands, they're moving towards Federal Hall in Manhattan underneath the statue of George Washington. Okay, And, uh, I mean, these... Dad, these hippies are everywhere. There's a, a drum circles about to break out at any moment. I mean, we don't know what we're going to do here. <laughs> They're getting ready. Their their anti-American ideas are happening. I mean, who who's going to step in here? Who's going to challenge these guys? <laughs> Two hundred construction workers walking down the street under Peter J. Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting the entire episode to hit that sound bite. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> oh, it's all good. You can't not see it that way, you know. And we're gonna ask um, uh, Coons will keep the the volume down on the video. But if you search "hard hat riots" on YouTube, there's like a minute and eight second clip that shows you the legit violence that's breaking out that we're covering right now. So. These workers, about 200 of them, waving American flags. Their numbers started to swell, by the way, because there's people on lunch breaks coming off of job sites to come march with them. And anybody else who's just tired of, like, the flag burning, kind of the counterculture types, they start walking along and they're protesting. USA all the way, love it or leave it, that kind of a thing, you know. Uh, they took our jabs. I mean, anything you can think to start screaming at these people. But, and uh, you know what? I think, too, a lot of the sentiment, too, was to show support of those guys who were serving over there. Yes. That if you're – it almost became if you're anti-war, you're anti-military, you're anti the grunts on the ground who were bleeding and dying for this whole thing. That right. Well, they like didn't said, have the victim here is nuance. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. 
absolutely. So, um, but yeah, so now these 200 construction workers can converge on these guys. And there is a police line that was set up, a very, <laughs> a very thin police line that was supposed to separate the two opposing sides, if you will. Um, and there was some pushing and shoving, and then they broke through the police line. And you can continue, Kev, with uh, your... Uh... Well, I'm not going to Hulk Hogan it up anymore. We're good to get there. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, yeah, so the construction workers are coming through. They start pushing up against the police line at first, so it's kind of a little shit-talking. You know that bar fight when it's the two guys who get loud enough so that they can make sure that the bouncers separate them? That kind of a thing? That's what it starts off as. And then, all of a sudden, it's go time. All right, and the construction workers snap. Uh, some of them start using their hard hats uh, as weapons. That's what people, witnesses were saying they saw that. But um, Peter J. Brennan denies anything more than fists got thrown. Okay. Um, and they break through the police line. Break through or are allowed through, depending on who you're talking to. Most of the cops were sympathetic to these guys because Lindsay, again, not a popular mayor. Uh, we have a caveat for his final little end here, too, because... Um, uh, Lindsay uh, uh, earns the ire of the NYPD forever. Um, but uh, as uh, Kahuna's pulled up the, the footage here, you can see it, buddy. Are we? It, do you feel better now that we, we set the groundwork before that fight? Because we just showed you that fight. You'd be like, what happened? Did the, did the Pistons win the NBA conference final? <laughs> <laughs> no, you set it up perfectly, and I encourage people to go look up the, the footage and watch it themselves. It's one, of those, it's one of those things that go hand in hand because it really – it's a sight to be seen, man. Because like I... they just come storming in, man. It, it feels like a little bit of it reminds me of, and I said it obviously because it's, it's the location being Federal Hall, um, but it does feel like when the cops are marching towards Bane's crew at the very end. Also, and yes, it was filmed in the exact he same did spot. Kahuna found out while you were talking, by the way, Dad. He confirmed that's the location. See that okay. picture on yep. there he brought up? So. Absolutely. <laughs> but there's a little pro wrestler to it where it's, uh, you know, uh, Stone Cold coming down the ring to go open up a can of there's also some, uh, uh, you're sitting there and you're a protester, like, you know, all we're saying is give peace. Oh, shit, I'm getting punched in the face. Like, this is, someone, this is wild. Someone, yeah. it was kind of crazy while, uh, while Pops was talking about it. He, uh, the minute he said, broke through the police line, the footage actually lined up <laughs> and showed the- them <laughs> breaking through, through the police, police line. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> yeah, Because yeah. you can see them move the cop car like, uh-oh. And yeah. then yeah. that pace that they're walking, because you guys can't see this, I, I encourage you to look it up like um, Kahuna said, but the pace that these guys are walking in at, that's not a marching pace. That's not a waving to my kids, let's get a photo opportunity. That's and then a- you see le- legitimately, to, just to describe it for you guys, you see the army of freaking hard hats coming this way, <laughs> but then you just see a squadron of hippies sitting down, standing up like muskrats in the fucking wild, yeah. turning around <laughs> and like, oh shit. Dude, my dad's here. I told yeah. you he was going to find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure uh, the station wagon wasn't double parked, man. Stone cold, stone cold. I wonder how many VW bus keys were lost in this riot. Well, then well, they also stormed City Hall and raised the flag back up to full mass that they weren't going to have that shit. Nobody's going to lower the American flag to half mast. Now, a, 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 again, another thing that happened in um, the Irishman. Remember, Hoffa ordered that the flag be raised to the top, uh, ignoring the death of um, uh, was it? I guess it was JFK. Um, but another. So there's obviously we're making. I'm making a little bit of light of this, and you and me have had some disagreements was, uh, about it. Bobby Kennedy. Bobby that, Kennedy. There you go. In, in the um, movie, the the Irishman. Thank you. Um, but uh, so you and I had a couple disagreements about this episode because. I'm finding some humor in it because I'm viewing this as an episode of South Park. So that's kind of where I, and I'm not emotionally connected to it because obviously I didn't live through it. But that you can't paint these guys in a, a heroic picture here because um, as they're breaking through this police line, they are roughing up people who are well within their rights to be protesting. Um, I couldn't find evidence of any flag burning going on uh, in the uh, original protest. So it's not like they saw the flag burning and that's what enraged them. And they were organized because Peter J. Brennan did want it to be a, quote, pro-war or um, uh, pro-Nixon event. Now, the other thing, too, is that once they break through the lines, they start specifically, there's people on the ground who heard this. There's also a conspiracy theory that two men in gray suits orchestrated the whole thing. They were directing people, pointing which way to direction, like, you know. Yeah. 
it, the cops are thinnest over here, or these cops said that they're going to let us through, right, that kind of a thing. Right. Here. And then they were targeting Kahuna, by the way. So if you were at this protest, you have long hair. That's why I'm saying this. So if uh, you were at this protest, they would try to come after you because they would target people with the longest hair. So <laughs> what they wanted to do is they wanted to rough up. Uh, the Imagine remote? I was there. They take one look. Uh, sorry, wrong dude. <laughs> That's right, right, right. <laughs> and then let's be I'm you, you'd be one of the construction workers. <laughs> <laughs> let's be let's be honest. They take one look at me and they're like, "You're fine." Until <laughs> until I start talking, <laughs> then the minute I open my mouth, it's like, "Oh, you're a hippie." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th there is that. Um, I laugh at it in the sense of the, the Cartman thing, but uh, if you're watching this unfold on the news, uh, you know, as it's happening, that's terrifying. Especially if you're a kid, you're like, I can't even protest right now. Like, this is, we didn't do anything wrong here, man. But uh, the workers chase the protesters about. They move towards the other side of the City Hall Park, all right? And then on the steps of City Hall, the construction workers are now waving their American flags and their hard hats in the air, and they start to attempt to enter the building. So a rogue postal worker, all right, which is these are the good kind of rogue postal workers, not the going postal type, um, uh, climbs to the roof of the city, uh, roof of city, city hall, hall, I should say, I apologize, and uh, raises the flag back to full mast, like you said, uh, Dad, which gets a cheer from the crowd. Okay, now the flag then gets lowered back down to half mast shortly after by the mayor's office, which now leads to. The hard hats who were just kind of disrupting this now they're c trying to come into the building all right they start storming city hall uh in order to uh, raise the flag up again police are unable to restrain them due to their fear of the building being overrun much like the new york city police riots in episode one of the tammany hall trilogy right. we did and uh so we got hooking and jabbing going on in city hall yep and the deputy mayor gets panicky enough that he goes just put the flag back up and we're gonna we're just gonna go with it right okay <laughs> now what i found very interesting is that you know six people were arrested uh, more than 70 people are injured including four policemen and uh, six pe only six people were arrested in this whole thing um but what i found interesting is president nixon held an emergency press conference to defuse the situation because there were going to be tens of thousands of students arriving in Washington, D.C. for a protest rally scheduled for May the 9th. So I guess <laughs> old Tricky Dick didn't want any of that shit happening in his, in his own front yard. As you called a master manipulator. Yeah. It's, uh, um, it's generally believed that the action of the construction workers was not premeditated. However, many claim that Peter Brennan was behind us, and it just happened to be on their lunch hour. So Here's the wildest part. So some of them, majority of them, went back to work and finished their shift after roughing right. up the protesters. <laughs> right. But imagine that, just the, the, the cognitive dissonance to be able to say that, hey, man, uh, i got to get back to work here. I know we've spent our lunch break beating people over the head with our hard hats, but I don't want to get in trouble with my right, foreman. The shop, for, <laughs> shop foreman is going to be pissed if I'm late. Again. <laughs> Get this one, too. By the way, they broke into uh, Pace University right down the street, ransacked a couple buildings over there. And then there was also some anti, not anti, I don't want to call it anti-Protestant, but no, there no. was definitely some, the Protestants versus the Catholics are Sunnis and Shiites, essentially. Um in the the sense that they just can't get along. I don't think I don't think it was real. Go ahead, finish finish your thought. I'm sorry. Well, I'm a lot of, there's a, a huge population of Irish Catholic uh, workers that then tore down some of the uh, Red Cross and uh, uh, Protestant stuff over at uh, Episcopal the legendary Church, a Trinity, Trinity Church, Trinity yeah, Church, which is uh, a landmark in and of itself. Right. Um, now, uh, like we said here, LP. These guys go back to work. They wind up being viewed as heroes, depending on who you're talking to. And exactly. To the that, you know, they were in support, not so much of, in, I don't think it was really so much support of the war as it was support of the guys in the war, or at least Nixon's um, policies towards the war, that they were uh, in conservative versus um, liberals, whatever. But... Uh, you know, again, there's so many things that are intertwined with this whole thing that uh, it, it was re really, really hard to m make sense out of the whole thing. It, troubled times. There was such polarization with so many different facets of uh, American life at that time. Um, the one quote, too, from the, uh, the guy who took over for Peter J. Brennan uh, uh, that was on that video that Kahuna was playing, he goes, he goes, it was a release of our anger. And he goes, and yes, some blood was spilt. <laughs> so they weren't even hiding it on that one, man. But um, 
Also, uh, uh, that night, Nixon held, he holds a press conference to try and calm the tensions in right. the nation. And he says, uh, actually, I agree with the protesters. And, um, I mean, my goal is uh, in what I'm doing in Cambodia right now is actually to, to aid in your goal of peace, you know, yeah, so right. peace through violence kind of a thing. Um, and like you said, the, it, Nixon, you know, again, what a master manipulator. Plenty of loser fodder for some of the weird stuff that went on in that White House. Also, a lot of good came out of that White House, too. There, again, nuance um, dies in arguments but lives on this show. Um, so uh, Mayor Lindsay condemns the violence, okay, um, comes down hard on the rioters, and then even comes down even harder on the police response, which then pisses off the NYPD leaders who take offense to the mayor's remarks. They are stating that the mayor has now undermined the public's confidence in the NYPD and that they had gotten misleading directives uh, in the last couple of years from him. Like you said, Dad, not a popular guy no. before this. Right. Now imagine the shit coming afterwards. Now, several thousand construction workers, longshoremen and other white collars, uh, protested against the mayor on May the 11th. So <laughs> May was a, was a tricky month. This is all within weeks, by <laughs> yeah. the way, Cahoons. That's right. how fast this shit's happening. So there's a... a, a Construction workers protest against Lindsay, uh, holding signs, impeach the red mayor, chanting, Lindsay is a bum, and held another rally on May the 16th. And Sanchez, don't hustle. <laughs> <laughs> and May 16th, carrying signs, uh, you know, saying that the mayor's a rat, he's a commie rat, he's a traitor. Uh, you know, is he, is he pro-union? Nah, I don't think so. This is like but, that time frame when you'd, uh, say, you'd say somebody, these are the kind of dudes that when you say their name, they spit at the end of the sentence. Oh, Lindsay, that bum. <laughs> that's right, so, that bum. So that's May 20th. Another rally is held here, like you said, um, that uh, unopposed by the, uh, the anti-war protesters. So the, um, the college kids aren't exactly looking to, to throw down with the construction workers, <laughs> especially in the numbers that they now had at 150,000. And they walked down the streets of uh, New York City, and people who saw them, who were still considering the hard hats to be heroes, um, actually showered them in ticker tape. So it was almost like they had won the Super Bowl and they were coming back home. You know, they were a couple floats shy of uh, you know a parade in that sense. But um, a lot of supportive onlookers. Now here's the the craziest part. Um, I don't. I almost called him by his uh, his, his legit first name here, but um, and and devotees of the show have figured it out. But uh, Cahoons, if you had, um, you know, I, if, if you organized street violence, okay, you would understand that perhaps you'd want to keep a low profile afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. So uh, on May twentieth is that other rally here, okay? That was on, a pro. That was a pro war. It's a pro war rally. Right. Now on May twenty sixth. Peter J. Brennan, the man who orchestrated what erupted into the he didn't hard lay low, riots. Did he? No, no, no. <laughs> well, it was tough. He wasn't to. that kind of guy to. Uh, he was uh, Peter Shrinking Violet and blend into the wallpaper. What do you do? Meet with the guy. president? Are you kidding me? Yeah, absolutely. So May 26, Peter J. Brennan is invited to the Nixon White House along with several other labor leaders, where they presented President Nixon with an honorary hard hat. So. Here is a, here's the symbol, and, and it became a symbol, and that was a rallying cry for... Um, where's to, the hard hat now? To con uh, that sounds like it would be in a museum somewhere. Shit, where's Nixon right now? <laughs> you know, mm. <that's>, uh, <laughs> Half his memorabilia is... Uh, uh, I would be curious what happened to most of it. Um, but So uh, he winds up meeting over there, and uh, Chuck Colson, who was known as uh, Nixon's hatchet man, which, by the way, if out of the, the crew that Nixon liked to hang with, if you got the nickname the hatchet man... <laughs> You got some blood on your hands, brother. You could, that's a uh, that's a conniving kind of a guy here. When you can uh, you can you know out Kissinger Kissinger, mm -hmm. but um, he was the advisor and a, a campaign uh, uh, part of the campaign for re-election um, for Nixon's for Nixon, re-election, correct? Which is coming up in '72. So this is two two years into his first term. He's already starting to think about uh, getting elected again, and he needs to have something to rally people behind because he already broke half the promises that he kept. Uh, on his initial thing, like you pointed out, Dad. So uh, Chuck Colson identifies Brennan as a friendly, and Nixon would meet with him privately several more times, which leads to Brennan, again, a registered Democrat oh, at the start of this story, fully endorsing and supporting Nixon's reelection, delivering a lot of the union votes for him in order to get Nixon reelected. And then, of course, once Nixon was reelected, 
because uh, you got to take care of the people who take care of you. You know what I mean? Uh, he gets himself a little position in Nixon's uh, cabinet as the new Secretary of Labor. So he <laughs> organized street violence, depending on who you talk to, organized street violence um, in, uh, in the streets of Manhattan in you know, broad daylight and then gets awarded with a post in the presidential cabinet that he would then hold into the Ford administration. Right. So, <laughs> um, so he was the first pimp in the White House, essentially. No, oh, I, no I wouldn't way, go dude. that far. I don't, I mean, I don't think been... we haven't had anyone who wasn't a pimp in the White House. <laughs> it, 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 imagine that you wake up one day and you're like, you know, it'd be great if everybody listened to me. <laughs> this is crazy, man. Well, yeah. how is this not something that's so well taught more a little bit? Because this seems like because I've never heard of this ever. I, this is literally the first time I've ever heard of. The I thought Army it was a riots. joke when I first came. I came upon this maybe four or five years ago. Just just casual wormhole Wikipedia stuff. Now, uh, I'm when we end this one shortly. Um, I do want to throw to you for a casting couch. So start thinking about a Peter J. Brennan type Peter person. J. Brennan. All right, um, LP, you did a tremendous amount of research here. Um, I have a couple weird things. I lived things. it, dude. I lived it. Because <laughs> you weren't there, man. <laughs> right, you were there. That was a show on TV years ago. You well, you lived. There. Well, you lived in Jersey, so I right. mean, what well, was it? I wasn't it? at the riots. No, I mean, no, no, no. not saying but you I mean, were at the riots, yeah, but like, lived, what was it like watching that on the news I at lived the time? through the time period. Well, it was the same thing. I mean, again, Walter Cronkite is bringing you photos from Vietnam of people dying in the in the trenches, you know, when, wait, slashing when through you, the jungle. When did we lose Cronkite? Well, Cronkite died in 2000. I was on the USS Kearney uh. when he died. Um, but in terms of losing him, he meant losing his support for the war. Oh, but when Cronkite okay. started reporting about how um, right. uh, you know, it, it, the, the situation is not uh, yeah. getting any better. Well, that must have been as, I said, as I said earlier, the, the Tet Offensive was really the, a major turning point because we weren't just fighting guerrillas in the, in the bush. Um, we were fighting a major army, and you know, we were really— involving ourselves in a civil war, North Vietnam against South Vietnam. And, you know, ah, so what, 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 what are we doing here? We got involved. We got entangled with this whole thing because uh, way back when, Eisenhower and then later Kennedy were supporting the French as part of their uh, And what was French, that called again? The TED? The TET Offensive. T-E-T. Uh, T-E-T. Oh, okay. I thought that was Mark Wahlberg apologizing for the TED movies. <laughs> um it's uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you off here some weird stuff I found out about Wahlberg recently too. But um, I obviously Animal House, one of the uh, the greatest comedies of all time, has those uh, the iconic ending where it uh, it shows the people, the characters individually, freeze frames, and then says what they got up to afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to end sorta on that. Did you have anything else you wanted to throw in, LP? No, I think we're, uh, you know, I think we're pretty good on that. I'm, let me rustle some papers here so the folks at home can <laughs> make sure that we get it all. Well, um, I'll tell you what I'll do, then I'll start uh, going on here. So, well, You know, uh, one thing. Hit me. Um, one of the positive. I mean, it, there was many, many positives. The, the, the 60s was not totally a dark period with riots and protests and everything else. I mean, in 1969, finally in July, we have some, you know, Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin putting for the U.S. a man on the moon. We won the space race, if you will. We were the first to get somebody on the moon. There were many, many uh, positive things that came out of that out of that decade but Stanley there was Kubrick's also making movies <laughs> there was also <laughs> a lot of worse. a lot of negatives going on too um but yeah and then also um we uh you know a return to uh the world series for the new york yankees that was um, part of the part of this whole thing too um uh, a major player in what turned people around about how we got to get out of vietnam was martin luther king i mean he made many speeches about um we were spending you know, all this money in Vietnam, getting ourselves involved with death and destruction to somebody else's civil war. Meanwhile, we've got people at home that are, are uh, in a very bad off, uh, poor economic straits that, you know, again, Johnson was trying to fi uh, found the, the great society in his terminology, um, at the same time fighting a war in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And there were many that felt that, uh, you know, that would be Instead of spending money on the Vietnamese, let the Vietnamese figure out what they want to do, whether they want to be communist or not. You know, What's that domino, term you used earlier? domino theory be damned. Let's uh, let's take care of our own kind of a thing. So, off. Uh, you mean you want to take your hands off the situation, perhaps laissez faire, laissez -faire as we were talking yeah, about right, earlier. Right, right. So, um, 
big appreciation on the research you did on this one, by the way. <laughs> uh, we got him fired up. We yeah. got him fired up on this one. Um, but uh, I do want to hit a couple other notes here just on the way out. Um, so, of course, we, we've covered this story. Uh, the hard hats get remembered. Uh, they, they were heroes for a day, if you will, getting reported uh, well on the news. And um, uh, people were, uh, if you were part of the riots or if you were a hard hat guy, then your lunch got bought for you the next day, that kind of a thing. So people were taking care of you. Um, and then, um, but there's a, some fallout from this. So uh, obviously the Vietnam War would continue for another five years, ending with the fall of Saigon, the iconic uh, imagery of the last chopper taking off. Um, Nixon would become involved in the Watergate scandal that would tarnish his reputation and lead to his resignation as the President of the United States. As of right now, first and only guy to ever quit the presidency. Resign. <laughs> we're, we're using... That's uh, it. I'm done. I'm yeah. out. Well, uh, screw you guys. <laughs> I'm going home. No. Um, Turn the lights off. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Lindsay would become public enemy number one of the NYPD following the riots and his creation of the Knapp Commission, which investigated corruption in the NYPD following the reports of a certain one Frank Serpico, played by Al Pacino in the movie Serpico. There you go. All right. Um, Mayor Lindsay uh, was also, he became such a villain to the NYPD because of the investigations. He was told not to attend NYPD funerals, and if he chose to, he was heckled and booed by the cops in uniform and especially their spouses. One spouse in particular uh, told him, I do not want you coming to my husband's funeral because he died in the line of duty. Um, but uh, this would actually lead to Lindsay then switching parties. Okay, so he now bails on being a liberal Republican, makes the shift over to a Democrat. And again, throw out the terms. It doesn't mean anything here. But it is important that he makes the jump. That's what we're trying to say here. And he decides that he's going to run for president against Nixon. Okay, he's hoping to seek the Democratic nomination now. Okay, uh, in order to run in 1972 against Nixon, he is unable to get the nomination. Nixon is then reelected in an electoral landslide, okay, which had not been seen in the country yet. At the time, it was the biggest electoral landslide in presidential election history, and the maps were reshifted based off of this now all of a sudden um, appeal that the, uh, the working class voters were, well, at least were waving the flag on this side kind of a thing. All right. Uh, Lindsay got so unpopular that in 1978, the New York Times referred to him as the mayor exiled within his own city. So, yeah, that is um, you want to talk about getting put up in a Tower of London type thing and you're not <laughs> welcome down here. OK, um, it is. Uh, it was a wild one, man. Yeah. But you said he and he. He created the – damn it, I'm blanking on the name. Commission. But to, the commission to investigate the NYPD commission. Yeah. corruption. Yes, sir. Yeah, of course that's a problem to some people, but doesn't that eventually help in the long run? Like, is that yeah. at least looked at in a good way now? Have or? You, um, yeah, well, have you seen uh, – I'm just talking about why he was vilified by the NYPD. Well, yeah, yeah. Under, well, I can understand – why, from their perspective at this oh, yeah. time, but at the same time, upon reflection, is he like a kind of guy where people look back and be like, okay, maybe that wasn't that bad? Or is it like he still looked back as like one of the worst mayors? Well, it's weird, too, because New York's history of mayors is fascinating because then you're going to have uh, – you're going to have a – there's Abe – what was the guy's name? Abe something, Dad? Who took – Abe Bomb? Abe Beam? A beam. A beam came in after him. Ed Koch. Uh, well, you had uh, Dinkins, uh, Dinkins. Ed Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani. So mayors in New York get um, they get graded at the time, and then they get graded about thirty years after. So that would be interesting to see how people see Lindsay now. Um, in terms of presidents, too, you can judge a president on his popularity at the time, and then you can look at him thirty years later. Case in point, another loser, Warren G. Harding, extremely popular while in office. As soon as he dead, as soon as he died in office, by the way, um, they looked around and they said, wow, what a giant piece of shit. And he's <laughs> consistently ranked by historians on the lower tier of the worst presidents we've ever had. Right. Now, before we toss to the cahoons for, uh, our, we're going to go out on uh, the casting couch, brother, all right? Um, and thank you again for everything here today. No worries, um, man. So Mike and Ming take fantastic care of us. Uh, they do have to pay the bills, though. So I want to say thank you real quickly to uh, three people in particular, uh, John Greco, uh, Matt Dalzell, one of my oldest friends from Camp Lewis, uh, and Eric Kilroy, who jumped on board already and have uh, donated to our Patreon. Uh, I will not lie to you guys. I have to learn how to use it. i got to break down the, the medium, if you will. All right, I'm going to be uh, picking uh, Kahuna's brain, Ming's brain, uh, any other creators out there that I know of. 
We guarantee you, though, you will be getting, if you become a paying member of the Patreon, at the bare minimum, a fifth bonus episode that will not be released to the public. Okay? You guys can enjoy that, and that's a thank you from us uh, to you. Uh, for, for A, for you helping us pay the bills here, because I, I, they do have to charge us for the studio time. They're generous, but <laughs> they, we do have to uh, uh, pay our bills, too, on this thing. I can't operate at a deficit anymore, LP. All right. <laughs> I got yeah, that fifth episode might be coming live from South Beach, but <laughs> <laughs> well, we got I mean, we can too. make it happen. <laughs> there, yeah, we can start doing Skype calls in, but uh, <laughs> there's other stuff we're looking at. Um, some people have asked about sponsoring an episode, so we're going to figure out what uh, uh, will be the appropriate amount for that one. And I'm very grateful because the fans of this show have just been absolutely amazing. Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, there, there's so many people. Uh, Patrick Chisty is a person. I'm screwing up names here. Jazz Rec, uh, you know, everyone on Instagram and Facebook, they all use these different names. I, I love all these people. They're really uh, Mott Spock. I mean, come on, I can't, you guys got to work with me on something here. Send me a DM, tell me how you want to be called on the show, all right? Because I, I love giving shout outs, especially the people who love the product. And of course, um, you know, uh, our diehards from day one, Nick Franco, Stu, you know, Stu's, I hope Stu's feeling better, by the way. I know he was sick for a little bit. Um, and then also uh, uh, Rachel Veronica or Rachel Torres, as I found out her name is, who, Listens to the show out in Texas, okay, Kahuna? Listens to the show out in Texas. And then it turns out, graduated high school with my cousin Greg in Parsippany, New Jersey. <laughs> really? Yeah. He's so, a Jersey tie-in. <laughs> small, world, small world getting smaller. Uh, LP, we're going to do a couple more before you go back down to Florida, but um, yep. this one was fun. Thank you for, for giving the personal take on this one. I know um, you, uh, this one, we, we, we stirred up some emotion in you. On yeah, it was, it, was, it was tough. I mean, uh, again, it was... Troubled times. Uh, I can remember as a college student being in the college, uh, watching a college basketball game and having uniformed uh, military personnel walking into the gymnasium and the crowd booing them. I mean, that shit don't, that just doesn't fly. I mean, to think about that. But back in the day, that was, uh, the country was so polarized that. Just because you're in a uniform, you're going to be heckled or booed. That uh, you know that was their form of protest against what was going on uh, in the country. It, it's just craziness. That meanwhile, thankfully, we've gotten past that, and we're supporting supporting the troops. Going to say then your your own son wearing his navy uniform right. walking around Chicago. Well, I wasn't got wasn't coeds me. trying to take pictures with me. <laughs> well, there you go. I like to put on a band uniform and have coeds trying to take pictures with me. <laughs> yeah. Now my Different father had uniform. some strong opinions on this. He he told me because you said in the car ride down, he said, I I totally understood the sentiment of the college protesters at the time, and that's why I felt so terrible about beating the shit out of them with my hard hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. And you know, one final point too. I mean, one of the big things is that you're asking these uh, 18-year-olds to go over to Vietnam and die. But you wouldn't let them vote because the voting age was still 21 at that point. Too. What was so, the drinking age at the time? Oh, that flip flopped back and uh, yeah. forth for the longest, depending on what state you were in. Um, it could be 21, it could be 18. Uh, or as mom said, it, it, was, it was 18 in New York and 21 in Jersey. So mom used to go, uh, there was some lake that if you went to the other side of the lake, mom could drink. That's <laughs> it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I hey. Know. Did oh, you know the sorry. missus at this point? No. No, that's, uh, that'll be another episode of American Loser. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, My poor wife. <laughs> My poor wife, what so, she got hooked in with. On our way out here, and uh, I, I love anybody who uh, loves the show. Tell your friends about it. Thank you guys for everybody who shares it. American Loser Podcast on Instagram. KP Burke Sucks on Instagram. KP Burke over on Facebook. We have to launch a community group on Facebook, I think, for people who like the show. Um, if you subscribe to the show, you get the show a day early. That doesn't cost you a dime, by the way. That's just us putting it out before I put the big announcement out to push numbers towards it. So, guys, help us out. Support us. Help us grow any way you can. I want to keep doing this thing. I'm having a lot of fun. And there's just a boundless limitless amount of losers for us to cover that's right We're um, no, shortage. no shortage of heroes nor, nor losers but and uh my final shout out is happy saint patrick's day to everybody um Aaron hey, there you go and um on that note it's time for the casting couch all right so kp i'm not gonna front this one was a little weird because i was like this could be a great story but it would come down to the casting now the person i'm choosing I only came up with because you referenced a certain movie about a half hour ago 
I think I think it was called Animal House. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm not going a comedic route, and this actor is no longer with us. But I think because I've seen him I'm in excited. certain movies that I think would be pretty pretty cool. So I'm going to go with John Vernon, who played the dean. In Animal House. Wow. I thought another John, but I just pictured Belushi as Brennan. Get him! <laughs> right. Food fight! That's right. But I think seeing him in the chops that I've seen him, and especially also in Dirty Harry, I think he's no longer with us. But if he were, I would have cast him as uh, yeah. as Brennan. He's a great actor, too, man. He's in my one probably uh, my all-time favorite movie, uh, The Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, right. Wow. So. Um, so that's a great one. I like that. Now, I thought, too, in my head, I thought it would be hilarious if you had uh, just one of the construction workers. was. You didn't have to. You could have one man green screened 100 times to be all the construction <laughs> workers, and it's just all John Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he wouldn't be bad either. He's He's got that. He's also got that energy. And you know what my first exposure was to John Vernon? It wasn't Animal House. It wasn't Airplane 2. It was a little... A little tiny Disney movie released in 1980 called Herbie Goes Bananas that Big Kahuna <laughs> watched when he was maybe t- like five or six years old. So, yeah, I would cast John Vernon. There like it, is man. your Kahuna's casting couch. Well, hell, we went a little long on this one, but it's too good of a topic. Um, and, uh, again, thank you so much for everything here. Mike and Ming, I'm sorry, guys. I can't change. All right? We don't know. <laughs> We're beyond changing here. It is what it is. But uh, thank you guys so much. Um, that was the Hard Hat Riots. American Losers. An American loser the day I was born. An American loser the day I was born. An American loser the day I was born.